On September 26th through the 29th, 2005, State University of New York at Fredonia, Chautauqua Institution, and the Robert H. Jackson Center hosted an extraordinary event commemorating 60 years after the Nuremberg Trials, a conference commemorating the living legacy of Robert H. Jackson. The principal focus of the seminar surrounded Justice Robert H. Jackson, who was the Chief American Prosecutor at the International Military Tribunal, which was held at Nuremberg. Nuremberg trials ran from November 20th, 1945 through October 1st, 1946. So the principal focus was on the Nuremberg trial. We also had a unique opportunity to talk about the other Nuremberg, the untold story of the Tokyo war crimes trials, which started May 3rd, 1946. One of the panelists was Robert Donahai, who is the last surviving trial lawyer of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East in Tokyo, who was also a prosecutor at Nuremberg, a unique role. He was also one of two investigators who worked very closely with the chief prosecutor in Tokyo, Joseph Keenan. His story and how it overlaps with Nuremberg is an extraordinary one. The Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals held in 1945 and 46 would set all the molds for the trial of the Japanese accused. Nuremberg would far overshadow the Asian trials in confidence, majesty, speed, and in the notice of world history. There were 11 nations that were attacked by Japan during World War II, and those were the 11 nations who supplied jurists to the international trial in Tokyo, and those were the 11 nations that were authorized to conduct their own national trials of Japanese war criminals. The United States, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Soviet Union, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, France, Philippines, India, and China would make up the 11-man international military tribunal for the Far East to try 28 men chosen from master lists as Class A war criminals. Evidence of Nazi brutality played before a shock courtroom in Nuremberg. 5,000 miles away, Robert Donahai and his boss, Joseph Keenan, touched down in Tokyo to start their jobs as war crimes prosecutors for the IMTFE, the International Military Tribunal of the Far East. The U.S. team was all on that plane. We were inviting MacArthur's name and the President's name, the other nations to join us. Keenan was very much against inviting the Soviet Union, but I think the White House ordered him. You're, first of all, your background, Bob. What, what well, I, uh, I became, I probably wouldn't be here today except for the fact I lost a leg in an accident, uh, and that got me into a lot of different things. And, including a veteran status in the Coast Guard and other things. But um, I, uh, I guess I had pretty well determined I would not be going away to college, school of any kind. And then um, when 19, oh, let's see, about 1936 came along, uh, I began to uh, look for a reason to go to school. I had just been in an accident, lost my leg, and realized that if I was going to make a living, I was going to have to use my head a little bit more than I had been. Yeah. And um, so I found one law school that uh, uh, was a one-year law school originally, and by the time I got there, it was a two-year law school, Cumberland University in, uh, in Tennessee. It had a literary school as well as a, the law school, but. Um, I went there and um, uh, came away with a, an LLB degree, and uh, I apparently had a, a certain uh, ability at trial work, and I uh, got into uh, a rather well-known trial 
firm in, uh, in Nashville shortly after I received my license and, and did a lot of their trial work. And of course, the war was just coming along at that time, leaving a lot of their, war, their, their top lawyers going off to the, uh, the services of one or another. They were in the reserve mostly and went off to the war. So I began to pick up more and more pieces of the trial work that was being left behind. For the next five years, I was doing two things. I was in the Coast Guard because the Coast Guard began to look for a unit in Nashville, which was called a temporary reserve. Uh, the reason for that is that the Nashville Bridge Company, which is building bridges which went all over the world from Nashville and by barge down the rivers to the Gulf and to the oceans and the Great Lakes and so forth. It um, converted to sub building subchasers. They got a contract with the government, began immediately to build subchasers when the war broke out in uh, 41. And um, so the, I saw a little story in the, one of the papers in Nashville that they, they were recruiting for a temporary reserve in the Coast Guard and uh, that they wanted to patrol the Cumberland River. Uh, I thought, well, that'd be one way that I could get into service. I hadn't been permitted before that. And that's what happened. I, I joined up and pretty soon found myself in a veteran status at the end of five years, uh, discharge at the end of five years. And uh, I had had the experience of both service and when I was not in uniform, I was trying cases. So it was a, a, a wonderful experience for me. Well, getting living in the both, best of both worlds, which I wanted. And uh, as the other lawyers became coming back one after the other at the end of the war, and I had been discharged from the Coast Guard along about September, I guess, of 45, I had, a, I had a murder case pending in the United States Supreme Court that I was going to have to try sooner or later and did, but uh, I went up to get admitted to practice. The rule at the Supreme Court was that uh, you had to have been practicing five years in the highest court of your own jurisdiction before you were eligible to be fully admitted to the Supreme Court of the United States as a lawyer. At that time was the Attorney General and I knew him had volunteered to present me to the Supreme Court and, uh, and did. As we came out of the top uh, steps of the Supreme Court and were standing there, uh, the other lawyer, there were three of us standing there, was from Nashville and who was in that same case with me. Clark turned to him and said, are you planning to go to Tokyo or not? And uh, the other lawyer said, his name was Whitworth Stokes, said, uh, well, no, General, he said, my, uh, my wife doesn't want me to go. Why don't you ask Bob if he wants to go? He said, do you want to go to Tokyo? And I said, what would I be doing? And uh, I thought it was a funny kind of a look on his face as he said, recodifying the laws of Japan. <laughs> and I said, good God, the only word I know is sayonara. <laughs> and so, um, that was the end of that conversation, except that he said, well, if you want to go to Tokyo, be in my office. Didn't seem to phase him at all, be in my office at one o'clock. This was like 11 in the morning. So we went back to the hotel and typical of Tennessee lawyers, we had uh, a bottle of Jack Daniel whiskey and, uh, <laughs> and a tureen full of French onion soup that they sent up from Carlton Kitchens. And so we have a little soup and a little whiskey and. And uh, finally I said, I called my wife and said, how would you feel if I, she was expecting our third child? We already had twin sons, one of who's here with me today. And um, the, uh, the third was on his way, but just about a month and a half from, uh, had, he'd just been, uh, been in the womb for about a month and a half. And so, <clears throat> knowing that he was coming, she was not too anxious to have me go off very far, but I knew I was going to have to have a salary someplace with the, all these other lawyers coming home reclaiming their practice. Life was not going to be quite as easy as it had been, and I, uh, 
uh, I wasn't quite sure what I would be doing. So I decided it'd be a good idea to go over and see what Clark was talking about. He had already gone to Boston to make a speech when I arrived there, and his uh, Alice O'Donnell, who was one of his top, ass top assistants, said, well, he told us that if you came over, we should call the White House and make arrangements for you to be interviewed. Well, right away, of course, that said to me, this can't have much to do with the codification of laws. And uh, so I went over to the White House with the recommendation of the Justice Department. <clears throat> they did a lot of cross-examining of me, and uh, pretty soon I had an investigation going in my my whole life, I wasn't quite sure why or what, what I was up against, but the, uh, the whole thing seemed kind of mysterious. I kind of suspected war crimes, but I wasn't sure. And um, down the line someplace, and I sort of put it out of my head, I knew people called me from here, there, and elsewhere, saying, the FBI's been investigating you, what have you done, you know, that sort of thing. But, uh, by that time, I'd sort of given up the idea of having anything going there until the other lawyer from Nashville called me and he said, we had a connection uh, in this way that he, uh, he had uh, one of the uh, top uh, administrators, one of the top uh, uh, Democratic congressmen had come from his law office. And the people that where I had been, had, we had one of the two senators, and so we had had connections that were political on both sides. This whole thing got to be pretty political. I wouldn't want you to think it was just as they said Donna is the best lawyer, but uh, they were just I had some connections, as did this other lawyer. Anyhow, he said they called me from Washington and told me to make up my mind: am I going or not? And I said no. I, recommended you, and they said, well, call down high and tell him that he's already been cleared, and if he wants to go to be here on Wednesday or whatever day it was, and it was kind of a fast operation, didn't give me much time to get orders or anything. So I went to Washington kind of belligering, belligerently wondering what, what's this all about? They aren't even sending me orders. And I got to the Justice Department, and they said, well, we have no money to pay you if we hire you, and uh, We've asked the War Department to put you on the payroll. So uh, you carry these papers over there and you'll be a War Department attorney, and, uh, but on our staff. So that's what happened to me. The first, uh, first trip to Tokyo when, when our team went to Tokyo was November of 45, December of 45. And the head of the team, the chief? That was Keenan. That was Keenan. Joe, Joe Keenan was the head of the, the whole unit. See, there were 16 of us uh, attorneys in that team. I was the 16th, and they were carefully chosen, every one that they had on. And I was, I was a replacement for this other lawyer who had decided that uh, he didn't want to go. And uh, he had political support that was withdrawn from him and transferred to me. So it, that's partly what was happening. And Keenan seemed to like me, and I, uh, so we got along pretty well. And as, when we got to Tokyo, Keenan had a certain personality problem that uh, split the staff right down the middle, partly because he had had, uh, I suppose, experience with some of the lawyers who came out of civil service from the Justice Department and uh, felt that they knew Keenan at times when he had been the head of the criminal division there. And, possibly were not his best friends, and so he, part of the team that went were not his choice, they were the Justice Department choices, and his immediate assistant chosen by Justice was a fellow named John Darcy. He didn't like Darcy and fired him the minute we got to Tokyo. <laughs> Poor Darcy, who was a very good administrator, uh, was suffering there. He didn't want to go back looking like a failure to the Justice Department, and Keenan had no right to fire him from the Justice Department, but only from his own team. So it was a kind of an awkward situation where Darcy took up residence in one of the hotels and prepared a phase of the case, which in the end was really a lifesaver for Keenan. Darcy was a good lawyer.
Bob, who picks who's going to be prosecuted? Does Keenan personally do that or Ed no, McCarthy? No, 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 the executive committee. Each country was given an opportunity to present its case, and I suppose at the end of the road, Keenan would negotiate with McCarthy. Unlike the German trial with its famous Goering's, Hesse's, Speer's, Rosenberg's, and Streicher's, the Japanese defendants were a faceless lot with only the wartime premier Hideki Tojo widely known. Doihara, Araki, Hashimoto, Itagaki, Matsuoko, Konoye, Kido, the alien names and faces ran together in the Western mind. The tired old men who once ruled with iron the vast distances from India to the Gilbert, from the frozen Aleutians to steaming New Guinea, now awaited judgment in the three tiers of Tokyo's squat, ugly Sugami prison. They must have known that their greatest ally would be the 20 million square mile sweep of the former empire. The aggrieved, already burdened by barriers of death, language, hiding, and evidence destruction, would mostly have to make their testimony felt over thousands of miles, picking faces from faded photos and making affidavits from faltering memory. And you see for the very first time Tojo. What's your reaction? Well, of course, it wasn't the first time I'd seen him in uh, a number of different occasions in his cell. Uh, Tojo had an arrangement, or I should say, Jack Feely, who had been selected, personally selected by Keenan, uh, pre-selected by him before we left the United States, to be the one who would handle the Tojo case per se. That was what Keenan and Feely had agreed on between themselves. Why, I don't know. Apparently. Keenan seemed to think that Tojo was a, the kingpin that he wanted to try, and so uh, he was promised to be the, the lead lawyer in the, in the Tojo case. Well, that wouldn't have really come up until sometime down the line after, after the various phases. I'm talking about all these various kinds of pre preparatory phases that have set the stage for the trial before they really start uh, uh, getting to the accused themselves. There were 29, as I remember originally. Hashimoto went crazy. I believe it was Hashimoto, Okawa, one or one of the two of them. They were propaganda ministers. And um, one of them went crazy, and, and the other one, I think, uh, died uh, sometime during the, the process. There, were, there was one death, one death and one removal because of his mental condition. And so I believe that by the time I left the floor of the courtroom, there were 27 of them still there in the dock. I recall I had one funny experience. I don't know whether this is uh, one of the apocryphal things. While I was trying the case, in those days, the, the Klieg lights didn't come on very often. When they did, something interesting was happening in the, in the courtroom either from what I might be doing or someone else in the courtroom might be doing, perhaps the court would be saying. In front of me were the 12 nations of the court, actually 11 judges sitting up there uh, representing the 11 different countries, uh, a little higher up than the rostrum that I was speaking from. And uh, I'm down on the floor of the courtroom addressing them to my rear is where the accused are. I'm not even seeing the accused unless I turn around and look at them behind me. And uh, among them, of course, is Tojo. And suddenly the Klieg lights came on, and um, I looked up at the judges to see what their reaction to it was or what they were doing, and I could tell that they were not really directing their total gaze on me, but they seemed to be looking through me over at, I guess, would be behind me. Well, my first reaction was a curious one because uh, maybe, you know, maybe that's what people would normally think if they're standing in the middle of a, a worldwide uh, scenario and, and pictures are being taken. I looked down to see if my trousers were buttoned. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I thought, what, what are they laughing at? I could hear the laughter behind me. And so then I turned around and realized where the laughter was coming from. and. Uh, I think it was Hashimoto was standing up for Okawa and beating Tojo on the head and, and laughing. Both he and Tojo were laughing. Tojo had a pretty good, good expanse of bald head. 
laughter up in the gallery. I sort of looked down to see whether I had my shirt tail hanging out or anything. And I turned around, and here's a cow hitting Tojo on his bald head. Tojo was laughing, and all the other accused were laughing. And they hauled Ocala off, and he turned out to be nuts. And I think President Harry Truman appointed blunt, explosive Joseph Barry Keenan as chief prosecutor. A good lawyer and a student of history, some felt his need for alcohol made him not the man to handle the trial like this. Well, that's when I met okay. him. When I went, went over to the White House, he was the guy I was interviewed immediately. And uh, Keenan, uh, Keenan was a friend of both of our congressional people. I was talking about the senator. The senator was, the, uh, was McKellar, who was the, the senior senator at that time. And he was Roosevelt's closest thing to, I guess, uh, power on the hill. Mm -hmm. And the other was a House member who was the, was the speaker at that time. Uh, he was also close to Keenan. So Keenan had two people he relied on pretty heavily. One was uh, Tommy Corcoran on the House side, and I guess himself more or less on the Senate side. As, as being the liaison for the congressional help he needed. Anyhow, he seemed to be impressed with my connection and <clears throat> decided that, that he wanted to uh, have me on the staff. Keenan and I, he seemed to hit it off pretty well right away. Talk about MacArthur. What was the relationship between MacArthur and Keenan? It was very good, very close. I think uh, Keenan threw his weight. Keenan felt very secure as long as Roosevelt was alive. But he never felt secure under. Ever have any reason to have conversation or talk about Jackson's strategy at Nuremberg? I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, if he did, he didn't talk with me about it. I had a lot of conversation with him. I lived in his house. He didn't have with his staff. Well, it divided. Primarily, the staff was almost torn right down the middle immediately because of the differences between Keenan and the Justice Department lawyers under Darcy who were loyal to Darcy and not to Keenan. And uh, Darcy was never a loyalist to Keenan, which I thought was unfortunate because he talked against Keenan so much of the time that probably destroyed himself in the process. For going back to anything in the future, he went home Tom Clark became his best man in his remarriage, and then he settled down to practice in Atlanta, Georgia, until he died. Uh, I don't know whether Darcy ever was a success after that. I, I was in touch with him from Europe occasionally, and also from the Justice Department, apparently kept him advised when I was in Washington. Darcy and I didn't hit it off very well because I guess mainly because I was really a Keenan man. Now, Keenan was accused of uh, perhaps not being as efficient as, as they would have liked, and also alcohol was attributed to him. Is, was that a factor? Well, of course, alcohol was. He, um, he came home, and I guess, who was it? Was it Charlie Fahey? I've forgotten. One of the top officials over there at the... Uh, White House or Justice Department took over him and um, took him out to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and a couple of other places to help him get boiled out while he was back in the United, United States. That's the reason I was on the floor all by myself. Keenan would have been there normally and telling me what he wanted me to do. But as it was, I was getting my instructions from all the other top lawyers, of course, who were involved. Uh, I was just a puppet on string as far as they were concerned. Uh, I was down there doing vocal things that, that uh, any, any one of the lawyers could have done. Uh, the judging tribunal would be headed by the eminent Australian jurist Sir William Webb. As the trial opened on May 3rd, Keenan directed a prosecution staff of 72. The defense staff included 25 American lawyers appointed to aid the 79 Japanese lawyers through an unfamiliar judicial system. Find three classes of war criminals. In class A were Tojo and top policymakers. In class B and C were men who ordered atrocities, allowed them to happen or committed them. 
such as Yamashita and Hama, all pleaded not guilty. The indictments were broken down into groups. Crimes against peace included conspiracy of planning and waging wars of aggression, planning and preparing wars of aggression, violation of international treaties and agreements, crimes of murder and conspiracy to commit murder. And there were crimes against humanity, including breaches of law and execution of war plans from 1931 to 1945, violation of law by committing and or authorizing offenses before December 7, 1941, violation of law regarding the observing of the conventions in respect to the treatment of military and civilian prisoners of war. Keenan's wide-ranging indictment would pursue Japanese crimes from 1928 and include the staged Manchurian incident, as well as political murder at home, the Nanking slaughters, and Pearl Harbor. Added to this were plundering, forced prostitution, rape, prisoner starving, maiming, torture, murder, and a dismally long litany of other atrocious acts. The defendants were chilled at the quick execution that had been meted out to Generals Hama and Yamashita. These military commanders had been tried in the Philippines for the murders on the Death March and in Manila. General MacArthur, humiliated in the Philippines in 42 and smoldering vengefully against the generals that had fought him there, tried to see to it that no great jurists, lawyers, or legal niceties impeded the judicially illiterate military tribunal he appointed. It was a race to execution under rough and ready rules of class B and C trials. The uh, defendant's rights that you would know in a civil trial in such place in the United States, uh, those rights really didn't exist in a military uh, trial. The American lawyers shanghaied for the defense infuriated MacArthur by bitterly challenging irregularities under American and international law at every step. Going all the way to the United States Supreme Court, they lost the appeal for Hama. But in a scathing dissent, Justice Murphy wrote, the enemy has lost the battle, but destroyed our ideals. In Manila, the sentence was death. Mrs. Hama went to Douglas MacArthur, pleaded for her husband's life. Now, MacArthur did not grant that uh, wish, but he did change the method of execution. Originally, Homer was scheduled to be hanged, but with MacArthur's change, he was shot. Yamashita was hanged. Many of the other 5,700 B and C list prisoners were tried and executed within a week. 3 May 1946, outside the Ichigaya building, guarded by MPs, the defendants are brought to justice in blacked out buses. Shiny black limousines delivered nine of the 11 international judges. Two on the bench didn't arrive in time for the opening proceedings. When you get over to Tokyo, did Keenan finally then tell you what your role was going to be? No, we got to select pretty much what we wanted to do, and all of a sudden several of the lawyers found that they fit into certain phases of what ultimately became the trial itself and were able to contribute in that particular area. And I felt that this was an area that I was able to do something with. And uh, suddenly I found myself in charge of a phase called preparation of Japanese opinion for war, which when I got back to Tokyo in January, actually at the end of January, after I was able to leave my wife, assured that she was going to live. Uh, when I got there and back on the payroll, then uh, I, I felt secure economically for the first time in quite a while, and at the same time, uh, very insecure with family situations and not very happy about doing what I was going to have to do. But there it was. I had taken that phase on, and all of a sudden the administrative officials decided that it would be the first phase to be tried in the case of all of any new number of phases, but the first one that would be interpreting live witnesses, and that would be my, my job. So it, I had, I uh, say interpreting, I mean interrogating. 
So um, the first phase in the trial, other than the documents phase and, and other things that were sort of preliminary, uh, I, I really, I guess it was a sort of a kickoff lawyer in the, in the courtroom. Did leave a paper trail, and that was throughout the Pacific. They happened to be rather careless with some of the documents they left behind. So that as the Americans, the Australians, and the British fought, came up the, the island chain or through Burma, they collected documents. Unlike the Germans, the Japanese had burned thousands of incriminating documents. But suddenly, there was a break. After his arrest, this man, Prince Koichi Kido, stunned the prosecution team with his diaries detailing some 6,000 entries covering events in Japan's aggressive expansion by war. My faith. Key Kido became the working Bible of the prosecution and the key to the investigations. The names, the dates, the places were there for every major political and military crime. And there was a strange dance that went on between the prosecution and the defense during this time. The defense, in some cases, trying to get their defendants off, uh, but having to face the implication of possibly uh, putting the emperor on trial. The Japanese were whipsawed by the emperor question. If they held him blameless, they would have to say they acted against his wishes. Unthinkable. All the issues of national and personal guilt cried out for his testimony. But both the Japanese and the tribunal sternly put the emperor out of bounds to the raging defense attorneys. Tojo was a top man, of course. Tojo had a pretty good handle on things at the end there. He tried to commit suicide. About to be arrested as a war criminal, he shot himself with a pistol displayed there instead of committing harakiri. He failed to kill himself and is treated by an American Army doctor and receives blood transfusions from an American Army sergeant. A lot of the Japanese felt that he deliberately blunt. Describe Tojo. Well, we called him old razor brain, you know. That was the, the essential reason for it. And I remember one time when uh, I was coming out of the, the interrogation room with him, and I guess that sort of tells you the story about why they called him old razor brains. Uh, he asked us, um, uh, he said when, uh, every night when you leave here, the billy clubs would be poking his back, and, and they'd say, uh, uh, what was the word they used to poke with the, um, what was the Japanese language, you know, it was not a word in Japanese that when they're trying to think of, they poke them with a billy cup and say hubba hubba, and he said up until now I thought that remember, meant remember Pearl Harbor, uh, which, you know, we thought was pretty funny, at least he got a laugh out of us. That Tojo liked Gehring at the Nuremberg trial was sort of controlling the other defendants, or was he just sort of by himself? No, I think he had sort of, um, he had departed from the, the, the mainstream of, of uh, Shintoism, I guess, by attempting unsuccessfully to commit suicide. Nuremberg trials were going on and sort of winding up when you were starting the process at Tokyo. Were you aware, had you been following what Jackson was doing over there? It didn't, well, we, we were to the extent that we knew that, that uh, we were not going to be in real competition with, with uh, Nuremberg because the American interest was concentrated almost totally over there. First of all, there was the Jewish situation and all of the terrible things that had happened, decimating all of the Jewish people. Uh, in the various concentration camps. The horrors of the concentration camp were taking the attention of the American public to a very large extent, and I, I guess that was about it. Of the 28 that were initially in the dock, in the end, we had 25 for whom verdicts were uh, handed down. On 4 November 1948, after 50,000 pages of testimony, 419 witnesses, and 779 affidavits, the Japanese public waited anxiously for the verdicts. Accused Tojo Hideki on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East sentences you to death by hanging. Besides Tojo, General Doahara and five others were sentenced to death. 
16 received life in prison, including Prince Kido, the man whose diaries provided astounding evidence. W's volunteered as hangmen. Appeals were made to the United States Supreme Court, which decided by a single vote it had no jurisdiction to hear the case. The dissenting vote was that of Justice Robert Jackson, who had been chief prosecutor at Nuremberg. On the night of December 23rd, 1948, inside the icy walls of Sugami Prison, Hideki Tojo dropped at the word proceed. He fell seven feet seven inches down a boiled stretched rope. Like the condemned Doihara, Matsui, Muto, Itagaki, Hirota, and Kimura, he escaped the strangling fate of the Nuremberg hanged and died instantly. You were back in, uh, well, let's see, you would have been in Germany when the time the actual judgments were rendered. Oh, yeah. Were there any surprises? Well, I was kind of surprised that Iraqi was uh, one of the, one of those sentenced to death. He was a, a grand old man of Tokyo, really, you know, he was the, sort of the godfather of the, of the royal family and raising them up into their their military role in, in the uh, whole Japanese picture. He was a general, of course. His was military. He believed in the military. And he led the, he led the royal family down that sort of a primrose path into that, that part of uh, being a bigger part, I guess, of the military than they might otherwise have been. Were you surprised that Hirohito was not really mentioned at all at the trial? Was there a conversation as, I assume, defense counsel wanted well, to sort of bring him in? Well, I can understand why they wanted to and why a, a lot of the prosecutors probably also would have enjoyed getting, getting him in the agenda somehow, but it wasn't possible. We were told not to interrogate, not to try to interrogate the Hirohito and that, or anyone in the royal family at the palace, royal palace. So that, that left us out. Keenan was able to go there and uh, do whatever was to be done. After all, he was chief counsel. And um, we had to take it from there. He and MacArthur and a few few others at the very top were, were permitted in the royal palace. Both Tokyo and Nuremberg taught the world that there is personal responsibility for war crimes. Certainly it was far from ideal justice, but it was probably as close to just as one could get in those circumstances. Today in The Hague, the war crimes trial of former Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic drags into its third year. More than 210,000 were killed in what's been called a genocide. In Iraq, the interim government has begun the arduous process of trying Saddam Hussein and his henchmen. And at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, more than 500 Islamic radicals are being held as enemy combatants pending their military tribunals. As we learned in Nuremberg and Tokyo, however difficult the process, when the shooting stops, the courtroom is the best hope for future generations in meeting out final justice. For those dedicated to that noble cause, theirs is a war story that deserves to be told. I'm Oliver North. Good night. Tokyo were certainly the most famous war crimes trials, but in the years after World War II, thousands of other war criminals were prosecuted in places like Manila, Dachau, and Singapore. That yes. Roger Mansell runs the Center for Research of Allied POWs under the Japanese. The public was really aware only of the Tokyo trials. They weren't aware of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trials in Guam, Manila, in Singapore, Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. And, for example, on Guam, we executed 900 of them. Prosecutor Robert Donahai's work wasn't done. He left Tokyo for Dachau, Germany, for the trials of the Class B German criminals. But this time, for the defense. A fellow by the name of Lauterbacher, he had been personally chosen by Hitler. No question, he had to be. Donahai defended Hitler youth leader Hermann Lauterbacher, who succeeded Balder von Schirach, the man Drexel Sprecher sent to prison. I got an acquittal in the case. <laughs> I said, no, if I'd been on the other side, he'd have been. Bob, how did one get from Tokyo to Dachau trials? Give us the scoop. 
big old voice and a major who had been spending a lot of his time at Nuremberg and who had become ingratiated himself, I guess it'd be a fair term, on, on Telford Taylor. And Taylor apparently liked him, thought he was a pretty good lawyer, and uh, apparently promised him one of the Nuremberg cases. Uh, I'm not sure how, it, how involved that got, but anyhow, it ultimately turns out that the Hartman Lauterbacher case, which you were talking about a little while ago, or somebody was, mm -hmm. was um, was a case that uh, that Boyson had been promised, and he was able to combine that with some of the the uh, Doc Howe cases, the atrocity cases. How he managed that, I don't know, but he managed to get Lauterbacher thrown into the thing. I think it was a very poor poor job of. Uh, of choosing and picking and choosing his, his place to try that case. Anyhow, he did that and he made the mistake of coming into my office, pointing his finger at me and saying, Donahue, you're going to be my assistant in the Lauterbacher case. And I said, two questions, who the hell is Lauterbacher and who says so? <laughs> and anyhow, he, he said, well, Leo Goodman is the one that says so. Well, he was lying in that regard. Goodman was our administrative officer, and he was a very dear good friend of mine. He did assign me cases. He never assigned me any case I wouldn't take. If I didn't want to take it, he'd let me off the hook. And I figured this had to be no different. So I went to see Goodman, asked him why did he change this. And he said, I haven't changed anything. He came in here and asked to have you. I told him, well, it's all right with Donna High, it's all right with me. Well, I got a little bit hot-headed, and I said, well, they haven't left me out of my contract here yet. Let me defend the case against this guy. I'll teach him a lesson. That's what I really wanted to do, was teach him a lesson. Years later, I found this note from Lauterbacher in... Uh, well, before, before you get to that, I, I want to, just for the record, describe who Lauterbacher was. Well, Lauterbacher was being touted as the guy that was secretly selected to succeed Hitler. There may have been some truth in that, but in any case, he was, he was one of the choices down the line, I guess, that Hitler was looking at, a young and up-and-coming Nazi who, uh, who is now being tried in, in the wrong, he should have been tried alone at Nuremberg, I think, but anyhow, he wasn't, uh, because of Boyson's insistence that he could, he could get a conviction. Well, I got, a con I got an acquittal in the thing, and have a picture of voice and crying into his handkerchief. Now let me get this straight. Bob Donahue is op given the opportunity to uh, prosecute Lauterbacher. You... I turned it down. Turn it down, then you go on and... and defend him. Defend him, and you get an acquittal. I get an acquittal. Well. And I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> I mean, really enjoyed it because it... I got a picture of Boyson at the end of the trial as the acquittal was being read. He was crying in his handkerchief. <laughs> I don't know whether that was a mistaken picture or not, but it looked like that's what he was doing. He was sure crying into that handkerchief. <laughs> I don't know if you know some of this. There's a little biography uh, of Lauterbacher after your case. He was interned. He escaped from a prison camp on February 5th. I know about that. You know yeah. about that? And fled to Italy. Yeah. And in 1950, the Italians arrested him, returned him to Germany, and he apparently escaped again, this time to Argentina. <laughs> I didn't know about Argentina. And then you get a letter from him. No, I didn't. His wife called me on the telephone and asked me if there was, I could find out for her. By that time, I was the... Uh, I was the general counsel on high, well, I see, what was I doing? I was the uh, head of the, the legal and political affairs departments of military government in northern Germany, in Bremen. And she called me and, and uh, asked whether I could do anything to notify her so that she could notify Lauterbacher whether it was safe for him to come back. She apparently had gotten some word along the line that a lot of these people like Lauterbacher, or at least a lot of the top people uh, are being let off because we are now are concerned with the Soviets. And that was true, except I was not a part of that. And so I called the counterintelligence people and asked them whether or not they wanted Lauterbacher anymore. And they said, no, hell, if he comes home, we don't want him. Just uh, 
tell him as far as we're concerned, he's safe. So I called her and told her that, uh, or at least I called the people she had been staying with, and they passed the word along to her that it would be safe for him to come back to Germany. That's the last I heard of it until my wife and I were guests of the Shah of Iran in, uh, well, I guess it was along about uh, the 50s, I can't remember. How late was it? But uh, anyhow, we were in we were in Tehran, and when we came home, uh, there was a note that one of my sons, one of my twin sons, is here now today. I left on the dining room table, which says that Lauterbacher had called to thank me for having saved his life. And then, you know, my reaction immediately was was so crazy because I said, told my wife, that my God. You know, if I'd been prosecuting, he'd have been hung. I had no doubt about that. Yeah. But uh, and because of his position and so forth, I had no doubt that if I had tried him, he'd have been in the gallows. But uh, it's a difference in trial, I think, trial ability and capacity. I was a pretty good trial lawyer and a very good trial lawyer. I mean, I really won cases. And the thing that counted with me all the way more than anything else was not my reputation as a lawyer, but winning the case. I wanted the, I wanted the guy in the dock, whichever side I was representing, I wanted him to win the case, or that side to win the case. And so that's the way I tried my cases, all of them. I think that was a successful thing for me. And so I think it pleased the court that I wasn't being too egotistical while I was in front of them. Wow. I've gotten egotistical since then. <laughs> you have a perfect right. Bob, in order to get a successful acquittal of Lauterbacher, you were able to do something which no other defense counsel was able to do, and that was to get a deposition from Spandau Prison of von Schirach and Rudolf Hess. And in fact, you sort of finesse the opportunity to get the deposition of Rudolf Hess. What was your reaction of a guy like Hess? What type of guy was he? What's your comments? He was crazy, but I figured that uh, just from having read the whole case history of how he'd gone to England, I really figured that Hitler had sent him. I believe that Hitler sent Hess to, to uh, England and that he, uh, he knew this uh, Scottish lord whose property he landed on, who was a member of the House of Lords, that had agreed with him about his anti-Semitic thinking at that time, before before England and and uh, and Germany were at war. It was a, well a, during an interim peace period, so uh, it made sense anyhow that to me that that Hess got there with Hitler thinking that Hess would have access eventually to Churchill and some of the others before before very long, and that he would have the only chance, because what Hitler was afraid of is the United States would come in. We had not yet entered the thing, and Hitler was afraid that if we came in, of course, that he was not going to win his war against the Soviet Union. He was, he had a lot of things he was afraid of right at that point. And of course, that's the way it went. Uh, and, uh, and Hess, I think, was, was a emissary who was supposed to pave the way for it. And having failed in that, he just went silent. He wouldn't talk. He had a, a, a Colonel Scotland over there who was interrogating for the counterpart of the CIA, I guess, uh, trying to get statements out of Hess, who was never successful. He, he wouldn't talk to anybody until he talked with me. And I think that I must have struck the right chord with him because when he heard that I was representing Lauterbacher, that perked him up real quick. That here's a guy that was representing my side of the fence. And so he, he opened up and he talked very frankly. And I still have his original, well, I have copies of his original Xeroxes. And he did copious marginal comments and inner, inner lineal margins, uh, inner, you know, between sentences and so forth, made corrections and so forth. And at the end of the thing, a long paragraph in his own handwriting. There's no question this guy was he was as sane as, as I think maybe I am, which may not be very sane, but nonetheless, uh, 
he was getting away with uh, murder being thought insane, I think. But I think he was fooling everybody on that sanity question. Uh, so I promised him that if I used his statement at all, I would use it in, in full and that I would make sure that it got proper, proper uh, use in the press and so forth. Well, I never did because I didn't have occasion to except through that trial. But I, I didn't violate any promises to him either. So that was, that was very helpful. I, at least I had that piece of history. I still have. Terrific. Bob, uh, this is thank just you. been terrific. Well, you know, I make my, because I feel for myself too, I make myself sound pretty good. <laughs> <laughs>